Hello, everyone. This is Ron Bush, and you're listening to Chatting with Ron. Uh, Ron Bush uh, Consulting is a company that's dedicated to uh, helping businesses grow and, and, and secure themselves on cybersecurity. Chatting with Ron is a, is a podcast and broadcast from radio station that provides an opportunity for you to hear from leaders who are making a difference. Maybe authors, as is the case today, and they may be CEOs, government officials, or from any walk of life. Chatting with Ron is broadcast on WVLP-FM on Monday mornings from 8 to 9 a.m. and Friday afternoons from 1 to 2. WVLP is a local FM station in Valparaiso, Indiana, located at 103.1 on your FM dial, or stream us from WVLP.org. Check out their website to find all that they're doing in the community and how you can be a part of that. And if you prefer to listen to us on demand, you can find Chatting with Ron on Apple Podcasts, Spotting, Overcast, Breaker, and more. Just look for us on your favorite podcast platform under Chatting with Ron. We're hosted through Anchor FM, and if you're wanting to try podcasting yourself, I recommend Podcasting FM. If you're interested in underwriting the program, you can do so through WVLP FM at WVLP.org, or check out uh, Anchor FM, and if you're listening to this through uh, one of the podcast platforms, uh, there's opportunity there for you to underwrite the uh, the program there. We have a great guest for you today. Larry Rung, Young has written an excellent book entitled Walk the Sales Plank. This is a, a copy of it. Hopefully that uh, comes up the way it should, and uh, I know the camera has a tendency to reverse things. It's an excellent book. Um, thoroughly enjoyed it. Larry, uh, welcome. And uh, if you would, tell us a little bit about your your background. Yeah, absolutely. And thanks for having me on. Yeah, my background was in the corporate world, Ron, for the most part. I spent 20 years uh, kind of living that world and, and managing people. And I served as a market president for a large Fortune 500 company. One of the things that I was blessed with early on in my career <clears throat> is I had opportunities to start new business lines. And so I had leaders that trusted in me and gave me a a blank sheet of paper, if you will, and said, go run with it. And some of those business lines eventually grew to three, $400 million operations. And so about halfway in my career in that corporate world, I made a switch into the competitive world of commercial banking. And we had kind of talked about the competition, the fierce margins and kind of that industry as, as itself. But then I was then afforded additional opportunities to take over uh, markets and grow them. And the interesting thing, I, I kind of uh, ended up with a, a, a title. People used to call me the, the market resuscitator, Ron, because I would take over these markets that were dying and I had to come in and kind of revive them. You know, the, they were the markets that nobody wanted, uh, wanted to have, you know, or didn't want to run. And so I had to come in and, you know, change the people or the culture and, and build a process and a business development process. And so I gained this reputation and, and it actually served me well because I was able to continue to move up, you know, bigger and bigger markets. And I did that for uh, 21 years, just blessed with great opportunities. And then as you and I were talking one time, I made the leap into kind of the consultant world and the author and speaker. So the keynote speaker for conference and business development strategy using all of that experience. And now I'm doing even more of what I love getting to meet people and talk about it and talk about the books. So that's excellent. Excellent. Well, yeah. I've enjoyed, I've heard you speak at, at NSA, uh, not the, uh, no such agency, but the national speakers Association. That's right. And uh, uh, you are an excellent speaker. I've uh, also checked out your website. And as I, I said earlier, I just love your book um, at the introduction. It talks about, obviously I've got a, uh, some prepared questions here. So allow me to read. Sure. Uh, you're, in the introduction, you talk about how the selling climate has changed. What you've seen, what have you seen that makes the biggest difference in the last decade, let's say? Yeah, yeah. so <clears throat> right now, the, the biggest difference, and I talk about it in the introduction, is, is that your buyers today are wielding more power over the buying process than ever before. And research vets out that usually most organizations are 65 to 70% of the way through the decisioning process before they'll even engage a sales professional. Mm. And what that, what's that, what that's changed for them, Ron, is now they don't have the, the ability to go out and, and really create that rapport and that value. They're kind of being held off to the idea of, hey, Ron, I'll just call you when I need you. 
So the internet itself is not new, but the way in which buyers now are more sophisticated and they're shoving salespeople out has created more of an issue for those individuals. So if you think about it, what happens with organizations now is if their salespeople can't get out and create value and they're dealing against competitors that maybe have very similar products, then they're only left to compete on price. And when you compete on price, that's never a winning proposition for an organization. And so that's fundamentally what's changed, yeah. Yeah, I, I, I can identify with what you just said. You know, to complicate things, and, and uh, I think you, you speak of this as well, uh, we, we, when, when the internet came out, you had virtual meetings that took off. And virtual meetings were, were sold, for the most part, for cutting down on travel. If your sales territory is the U.S. or you're international, um, it costs a lot of money to send you out to see people. So speaking virtually cuts down on cost. And businesses, every business it tries to cut down on cost. If you don't keep your eye on the bottom line, you pretty soon don't have a business. At the same time, you've got companies, as you just said, they're using the Internet to research. So yeah. that cuts down on your ability to surprise them with new information they've already done the research they they right. they know a lot of about what's going on so expand on that a little bit uh, industry expertise versus sales professional in in the past i think the sales professional had the edge they had all the information walking mm -hmm. in yeah what, what do you think or how do you see that well, to, 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 to answer your question and to tie into what you just said, you know, we trained consumers and, and well, we trained businesses, you know, that you had to have a website that had to be the place that had all your products and your competitive advantage. It was kind of your virtual store. No shame in that. That's, that's the way we did that for a long time. But then the, now your decision makers are saying, look, Ron, if you've got all your information out there, I'll just go to that. Right. And then the salespeople have been left out. So the sales industry expertise that I talk about is all, I devoted a whole section in the book is really for the salespeople to take that back, to be able to go out and deliver information that is valuable for the, the, the decision maker or the companies that they call on. So if you think about it, what we typically do in the, in the old features and benefits, if you will, or the old way we used to sell is that I would go out and I would talk to you about my products. I'd talk about how great my company is. I'd talk about all the products that I have that could suit your needs. And the reality is that stuff's already out there. That's what they're vetting. Right. So sales industry expertise is about delivering Ron value to the, com the, the decision maker. I call it a conversation so valuable they'd almost pay you for the time. And it's by delivering keen insights. So LinkedIn did a survey. Uh, there's lots of researchers, but LinkedIn did a really a massive one, 1,500 decision makers. These are the people that salespeople call on to try to you know, win the business. 91% of those individuals, Ron, said that they want salespeople or will do business with salespeople that deliver keen insights, understand their industry, and are able to kind of help them see around a corner. And so the whole section of the sales industry expertise in the book is dedicated to start formulating that information that creates that value. Gosh, it, what, a, what a difference from then, from the old days when, uh, when we had to, to, uh, to walk in and we had, all the, we had to watch our body language and, mm -hmm. and all kinds of tricks of the trade. Not that that's not still valuable, but <laughs> now it's, and you call it industry expertise. Let's, yeah. let's delve a little more into that, the difference that it makes and how that happens. Yeah, so the industry expertise, you know, in the, in the old days, you, you really had some script. And the script when you cold called somebody or were trying to get in the door was simply just get me an appointment, right? Mm -hmm. That's all we were taught to do at all costs. And there's no value created, Ron. So if I cold called you and I said, hey, Ron, this is Larry young with xyz company i'd like to come out and learn about your business and talk about what's going on see what keeps you up at night and then tell you a little bit about what we do how does next thursday sound that's how we used to call but the problem with that is it creates no value and again on one side of it if, if they're vetting your organization they're 65 70 percent away from it and i'm going out to say i'm basically going to go ask you a bunch of questions there's no value created so what the sales industry expertise does is you start to sound different. The sales meeting sounds different. I don't have that, that piece in the book, but like with the consulting and the sales training, I focus on structuring 
a meeting and setting it up so that there's value creation. So I'll give you an example. So Ron, it would sound more like, hey, Ron, this is Larry Young with XYZ. I'd like to come out and share with you a couple of trends that are that your industry is facing, that your organization will affect their cash flow, your profitability, and maybe your bottom line. And those trends are things that you're going to face in the next 12 to 18 months. I'd like to come out and share with you, talk to you about those things so that you can make a decision on those things so your leadership team can focus on those. How does next Thursday sound? And again, you can script that any way you want, but if you think about the contrast, Here's what's different. The first cold call was all about me, wasn't it? I want to do this. I want to see. I want to talk about my business. The second one is all about you. Share information about your business, trends in your industry, so you can make decisions. That's the difference. What a uh, when I was reading the book, it struck me um, just full force. I've been guilty of the same thing. We're taught back in those days, back in the day. We were taught to go out. So tell me a little bit about your business. Tell me a little bit about, that's not how we do this now. It's entirely different. And it makes all the sense in the world. It's not ex what you just said. It's not about me. It's about you. So, right. so right. I come prepared with information about you. Um, so uh, how, how does this make a difference both to the industry and to the salesman, to the sales company, yeah. the company that's sending the salesman out? Yeah, so the so the big difference is that now I'm I'm taking back that control. It allows me to be able to do that. So if you if you follow some type of cold call script that is really about delivering value to you, then the meeting is conducted in a different manner. So in the old days, what we used to do, and you touched on it, is you go in and I look at, oh, you've got pictures of your family behind here, or you golf, or you went to this college. And so we would sit there in these conversations and try to create rapport. And then we would show our credibility by with the products and services we offer. That doesn't work today. And so what I tell people a lot of times, and they kind of shun a little bit at it, but right now in today's environment, the sales professional has to create credibility first. Rapport will come second. Doesn't mean that you can't be a nice guy and, and shoot the breeze a little bit, but you spend very little time in a structured meeting on that rapport piece, get to the credibility. Then when you win the business, you have all the ability to create that rapport and the relationship from that standpoint. What it does for their organization really, and what the book is structured to do is to be able to, for the sales professional to deliver powerful results, consistent results at the prices that they want because they're creating something that sounds different than everybody else says. I love this so much more. You know, I'm in cybersecurity. Yeah. And, and much of the training for salespeople in the past is there's not a lot of difference between that and uh, a social engineer. You walk right. into a, a social engineer will walk into a business, can be the receptionist, doesn't matter. And he sees pictures on the desk and he's, oh, what a, what a cute little girl. What is she, mm -hmm. about eight? And, yeah. and, uh, and she says, oh, yes, she's eight years old. Oh, well, great. My daughter's eight years old, too. What's her name? And you, and you just do that as a fact-finding thing to develop password uh, ideas for passwords because most organizations don't teach their, their people how, to, uh, how to, to, uh, to make strong and long passwords. So they're usually a daughter's name and yeah. birth date or, or yeah. what have you. So the salesperson would do the exact same thing, but with the, if it was the gatekeeper, which might be the receptionist or the secretary, they would do the exact same thing because the more you relate, the easier it is to get in. That's social engineering. And once you're in, in front of the CEO, what are you going to do? You're going to do the same thing. I remember reading one study that salesmen, uh, the top salesmen that did uh, all sold planes in top, uh, top industries, they actually breathed in concert with the prospect they were selling to. I mean, that's, that's right. how that's how much in in tangent with them they were. This is, seems more up and up to me. It's, it seems more honest. You're coming in. Let's talk about you, Mr. Businessman, Mrs. Uh, CEO. Let's talk about you and your industry. This is yeah. what I know. I've done my homework. I that's actually right. care about you, uh, not not trying to get you to, to trust me without a reason. Um, that's right. That's right. And Ron, too, you know, you think about it, it gives 
it, it gives the sales professional a lot more confidence because a lot of times in the old way, I felt like I had to go in and sell something. Mm -hmm. And what, what business owners today and decision makers are saying is you're coming out portraying yourself as a consultant, asking me questions you already know the answers to. Mm -hmm. What I'm looking for is more keen insights. And what it does is it gives the sales professional more confidence to go out and say, look, I'm coming out to help you. I play in the sandbox that you're in. I understand that. And I'm going to share with you some things of value. The key in all of this is the fact that the conversation doesn't really re revolve around the company I work for or the products I sell. We realize those are the tools to be able to deliver the results you want. But first, let's talk about what's going on. And then the other thought that I leave salespeople with is if I come in and ask you, tell me about your business or tell me what keeps you up at night and want you to educate me, how can I ever position myself as a trusted advisor? I've just admitted to you, I know less than you do. Right. Exactly. So, right. Yeah. And so this is about acquiring that knowledge. The book, that piece is about acquiring that knowledge that you can have an efficient and effective conversation. With your you give some, makers. some excellent advice as well in yeah. that book on how to do that, um, how, to, how to research, go about starting to research the industry. Um, I loved your chapter, chapter three, innovative ideas, uh, novel yeah. perspectives. I, on, the, on the first page, that's 23 in, in the book, I, I highlighted that strong decision makers think deeper than just superficial information. Uh, don't just come in and tell me stuff I know and everybody else knows common sense stuff. Come in and talk to me deeply. Give me, you know, yeah. drink, drink from those deep thoughts. Right. I, it just seems so, so much more integrity in, is involved. You know, the old idea of a salesman, which, which I don't think was ever true in most cases. I think most people are honorable and have integrity. And yeah. salespeople, I think, are like everyone else. Most of them do care. Yeah. But they weren't taught to, to express themselves that way. They were taught basically low level social engineering. You come at it entirely different. And I love that. I love that about yeah. the book. So um, how, did, uh, how did your idea, talk a little bit about how you got started, because you're different. You, you've turned a corner. You, you're taking us from the, uh, you know, the used car salesman stereotype. Mm -hmm. And that's right. a stereotype. Uh, there's, I'm sure there's honorable used car salesmen out there. So don't sure, write me sure. letters or anything. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> but um, but you're taking us from that and you're taking us to someone who really is an expert now. How, how did you, how did you turn that corner? How did you come up with this? Yeah, that's a great point. It was about, it was about 15 years ago when I was in the commercial banking world, one of the things that we used to do and I always did that was kind of unique is we would show them ratios, right? We would calculate ratios of the bank as we would determine risk. And I would take those ratios and there'd be hundreds of them that would be auto calculated. I would take them out. And I would show them to the borrower and say, look, I just want to show you what we're looking at and try to provide value to them beyond just the products that we would sell. Mm -hmm. And what I found, Ron, was uh, borrowers and decision makers loved it. They loved the conversation. They, they loved the fact that, um, uh, that we could share that and, and that I was willing to go beyond that. But then it all changed one day with a, with a customer. And I, I so here's the page of 100 ratios. And, and I tell him, okay, here's the, you know, the three or four, you know, that, uh, that I highlighted for your business. And he asked me, he says, well, that's great. I can see how you calculate them. But out of 100, Larry, why did you pick those three? Why are those three so important for my type of business? And that was the day about 15 years ago this all changed. Because what I realized was what you just read that excerpt is that they want more information. They want, they want to know that you understand their business and how it applies to them. They're not asking salespeople to come in and run their business, but what they want to do is they want to find out from all the sources they can, what's happening out there or what am I supposed to be watching? And then being able as a sales professional to synthesize that and have your own thoughts, that's what makes you stand out, to defend what you think and then you'll, and you'll gain more credibility that way. Excellent. Excellent. You, yeah. uh, you, you go through that story in the, in the book and I love the way you presented it there as well as just now you get into networking. Um, yeah. and networking of course is the big thing. We've got, uh, LinkedIn and, and all kinds of opportunities to network in social media, but I mean, chambers of commerce, there's all kinds of opportunity to network in, in, uh, 
uh, face to face, I guess, belly to belly, yeah. we used to call it. Um, what's the biggest mistake that sales professionals make when it comes to network? Yeah, so there's 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 a couple of them that that um, I see all the time when I'm doing the consulting piece of it. First and foremost, there's no process in place, so they 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 don't network. So a lot of times, um, uh, just like uh, testimonials, when you tell a sales professional, "Hey, you need to network," you know, they'll kind of roll their eyes and that type of thing. Mm -hmm. But the but but the question you ask them is, "What do you do every week to really establish that? Is that a part of your calling process?" You know, if you've got to do 10 calls a week, as an example, you know, uh, most of the time sales professionals, Ron would give me a couple that are just weak calls. They're just trying to fill them because I told them they need 10. Mm -hmm. But what I started to do was just replace those with two connection calls, two networking calls, two people you're going to go out and visit with and build, you know, further build that networking. The second thing that sales professionals do is they, they think it's all about them. And that's the big mistake. So when you're networking with people, it has to be all about the person that you're trying to develop the relationship. What you'll find is that there's kind of the old idea we used to have in networking, the, the quid pro quo, right? Where I would say, hey, you know, Ron, I'd be more than happy to do something for you. But then I kind of expect something in return. Right. And what happens is when you take that approach with people, that network and those connection pools become smaller because of mistrust. I feel like if I do something for you, then I've got to do something back. Right. And so those I think are the two mistakes that people make. They don't have a process in place and they have it more about what they're going to get in return. Oh, I that's, use a, I, go ahead. you probably see that in your, in your consulting world. I, I use a, I use an analogy in the book and, and it really goes to the point because usually when I say networking, people are like, all right, yeah, I got another book on networking because I devoted an entire section to that. And I use the example in the book of the soldiers, right, where you've seen the soldiers trying to climb the wall, you know, and, and so the first the first one will run up there and kind of form the bridge. And then the next one maybe steps on their back, grabs the top and goes over. And then this will all ensue as the soldiers are trying to climb the wall. But then the, the second to last person hits the top of the wall, stops, reaches over. And then while the guy that was performing the bridge will go get a running start, helps them up. You know, once they hit the wall, they pull them up. And so everybody's over. And so it's a great analogy. And in the networking, I call it authentic connections. Because sometimes when you have a pool of people you're connecting with, sometimes you get a free pass, like the soldiers that were just going over. Sometimes you're the bridge that's doing the heavy work for your group or your connections. And sometimes you're just there for support, the person pulling somebody over. Mm -hmm. But the key in developing a network of people around you that are authentic connections is it's a zero sum game. You don't keep score. And when you build people in your, in, or as a sales professional around you that open those doors, it, amazing things will happen. Gosh, what a great metaphor. Um, when you're at an event and spot that cold contact that you want to meet, first off, how do you know you're going to do your homework before the event? And then how do you approach the cold contact? Yeah. So, so keep in mind that there's, there's two themes that go through the entire book in all three of the sections. There's intentionality and then there's pre-planning. So when you have a cold call or somebody that's cold, a lot of times, again, always think about it being more about them. So when you go to meet them, so a lot of people, I'll use chamber events as a good example. So people go to chamber events and now you, let's say you see the mayor, right? You see the mayor across the room and you think, wow, that's somebody that could open doors for me. I want to try to build a connection with them. If I go over there and say, hey, mayor, this is Larry Young with XYZ Company. You know, um, I do leadership consulting. I'd like to visit with you sometime and talk to you about what I could maybe do for the mayor and the mayor's office. This is as an example. Mm -hmm. Again, kind of like the cold call script, there's really no value created there in that conversation, is there? You know, the, the no. So the mayor will probably take my card and say, I'll, I'll, I'll see what I can do. And he'll be polite and then he'll move on. We know what happens to my card a week from now, right? <laughs> <laughs> All right. So the, so the cold is really about doing your research before and finding out what's important. If the mayor is somebody that you want to meet and you know the mayor is going to be at that event, doing your homework, whether that's on LinkedIn or whether that's just people that know him or her. And then and having that insight. So now when I walk up to him, Ron, it sounds totally different. 
It sounds more like I'm mayor. My name is Larry Young. I'm a leadership coach in business development strategy. I know one of the things that are important to you is early childhood reading. And I know that that's an initiative, Mayor, that's really important to you. And there's some research that shows that when you combine basic leadership training with early childhood reading, actually their test scores when they get into school are higher and their college placement is even better. What I'd like to do is visit with you sometime about maybe how we collaborate together and see if we can help your project be better. And when you think about that as just an example, when you approach somebody at an event, that's going to sound totally different than everybody else in the room, isn't it? Yeah, definitely. Yeah. What a difference. Yeah. What a difference. But it's all about them, too. And you're backing that up to show that you've done your homework, you know what's going on, you know what's important to them, and it's all about them to get started, then prove your credibility. Excellent. Excellent. I want to take a quick identification break. We'll be right back. Um, folks, you're listening to Chatting with Ron. I'm Ron Bush. I own Ron Bush Consulting Incorporated. Uh, you could be listening to us in a number of ways. We're broadcast on uh, WVLP out of Valparaiso, Indiana on Monday mornings from 8 to 9, uh, Friday afternoons from 1 to 2, or you can reach us on demand at any of the podcast channels uh, well that I'm familiar with. There, I'm sure there are some I'm not, uh, but uh, Apple Podcasts, Spotify, Overcast, Breaker, there's a host of them. Where uh, the podcast is hosted by Anchor FM, I encourage you to check them out, but certainly check out our podcast. Uh, Chatting with Ron is underwritten by Ron Bush Consulting, but you're welcome to underwrite it by contacting the radio station, info at wvlp.org, or contacting, or rather, uh, listening to it on uh, one of the podcast stations. There's an opportunity there for you to support the podcast. We would love to have your support. So um, Larry Young is our guest today. He's written a most excellent book called Walk the Sales uh, Plank. Uh, I thoroughly enjoyed it. Um, let's, uh, let's pick up. We're talking about uh, uh, your book. There's a chapter on the gated community, and you talk about how to effectively upgrade your connections. Talk about that. Will you? Yeah, so I, I love this because a lot of times when I'm talking to uh, like a keynote speech at a conference or something, and I'm, I'm talking about building connections. Now, people understand in sales that you have to grow and you got to build your network. For guys like you and I that have been in our industry for a long time, you just naturally start to, to develop those and they just come over time. You've earned them over time. Mm -hmm. But usually someone will come up to me after a keynote, usually a younger sales professional and say, look, I, I don't have that. I can't open those doors. You know, I, I can't sit around and wait 20 years to build up these contacts. Well, there's a couple thoughts that I, that, that I, that I leave them with. And one is you have to start somewhere, right? There's eventually that group of people that's maybe in your center of influence. Well, eventually you'll grow to different type of positions and things of that nature, and you'll be able to open doors. But I wrote this, the second thing I tell them is why I wrote that entered the gated community, because you don't have to wait. You don't have to wait to be able to upgrade your connection. And by upgrade, Ron, I'm talking about the idea of, you know, getting the mayor behind you or something like that when you're first starting out. And um, so, the, so the analogy that I, that I use, or the, the research actually that I used, was based on uh, Life You Can Save. It, it was a nonprofit website that was put up. This is fascinating. And, and um, so they, they were doing this, and they would pick their demographics. So I would go on to donate, and they would get my, you know, my, my age and, and income levels and things of that nature. And then they would flash. So then I'd go to the next screen, and they would flash uh, uh, different messages up to try to test what people would give to versus what would they would give less to. And what they found in this research is that individuals that were of wealth, right, that, that had a higher income level, tended to give to causes that empowered people, right? So they, they, you, would, you would give the money, and rather than throwing it in a pool to maybe solve a problem, they would give it to a, a program that would actually better themselves. And the, and the research then when they flushed it out, what they found is that people that are, have our wealth or of power will typically give to somebody that will pull themselves up by the bootstraps, if you will, mm -hmm. right? So they're not asking for a free ride. They're asking, look, I want to be able to be empowered so that I can do it myself, kind of a fee, teach a man to fish type concept. Right. And so when you take that, what, what you could do is you can lay that over to the idea of building your contacts. 
And so what, what you'll find is that you can introduce yourself like in the manner I did with the mayor, but really what they really want to see and want to build that contact is somebody who will work for it. So a young sales professional can upgrade their contacts by being able to say, look, I'll work for it. I want to do something with you. I'll prove myself. I'll get in there. I'll roll my sleeves up, whatever the cause. And again, I take you back to the mayor example, but that's somebody that a young sales professional could go and say, look, I'll go in there, roll my sleeves up and prove myself. That's how you create contacts that are way up there, if you will, or upgrade mm -hmm. your contacts that'll move mountains for you. Gosh, what a concept. Yeah. 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 So, um, this kind of ties in with getting referrals and you talk about that in the book, uh, getting referrals as a powerful tool, but what's changed again between the old days and now? Yeah, it's funny. I love this topic, you know, because re referrals is one of those things that, and I, and I would guarantee if your listeners, when they hear you bring up the idea of referrals, now they're rolling their eyes, right? Yeah. You know, like, <laughs> oh, re referrals, you know, and uh, because it's so commonplace, but yet, What's interesting is that every sales professional and sales leader understands that a referral is the most powerful way mm -hmm. to open the door for somebody, right? And so, um, so I'll, a lot of times, Ron, I'll get the, oh, yeah, yeah, I got it, I got it, you know, kind of the death of a simple idea. Uh -huh. and, and, uh, and, and I'll say to them, I say, you know, if you realize that referrals are so powerful and re referrals can open the door, referrals can give you credibility right away above all the other noise that's out there relive your last five sales calls with me and tell me how many of those did you ask for a referral? And you usually get blank stares <laughs> because, because, because they realize intuitively that, yeah, all right, I know that it makes a difference, but I'm not doing it. And then they wonder why they don't ever do it. So I'll tell you a funny story. You asked how it evolved. So way back 20 years ago, I was a, I was a stockbroker in the late nineties. And this was a time when, when you were cold calling and calling out of the phone book. I mean, and, and I was able to go to top notch sales training. I mean, this is the best in the country for the, for this firm that I worked for at the time. And keep in mind that that is a different time. Most of what I learned back then wouldn't work today but this guy stands up and we're talking about referrals and stuff and he says you know what i do he said i take my business card that has the you know the stock broker on it he says i write on the back of it he said hey this guy made me a ton of money give uh, give him a call and he would take those i kid you not and his strategy was to drop them in malls right or busy <laughs> places so that people would pick up the card and say oh i'm gonna call this guy right <laughs> and, and and i, I love the story because it just goes to show how how archaic that is uh -huh. but how far that we've evolved you know yeah. and so what what i what i talk to people about there's a there's a powerful way when you think about building referral so if, if i asked you ron if I said, look, uh, would you refer me to somebody? I, you know, I do, I do the business development strategy. Would you refer me to someone? We, you, what we used to do is we'd say, Ron, give me two names, right? Give me two names of people you know. That's the, what we used to do. But if I, if I asked you to do that, what is generally one of your first concerns by giving me two names? What usually comes to your mind right away? Most people blank. They two names. Uh, gosh, who should I give them? And they just they're like a deer in the headlights. They don't know what mm -hmm. to do. That's the first thing that happens. Yeah. You're you're gonna respond to that. So go ahead and then yeah, I Yeah, no, a couple, no, it's, it's a great, things. great point. Yeah. So so usually the second thing then they use if they have some names is your own name in terms of your own credibility. So if you refer me to someone, right, as an example, and you refer me there, you know, what you want to do is make sure that I do a good job because your reputation's at stake. And, and now that seems really basic, you know, by and large, when I tell sales professionals that, but we have to capture that. We have to have a process in place that captures that credibility. So, so that I'm respectful of your name when you refer. That's why people generally don't give names. It's either, yes, they don't remember any, or they're worried that you might drop the ball. And so you have to have a process in place to be able to build that credibility. I can remember, see, you, you were in, uh, in financial services in the 90s. Uh, I was in it in the, in the late 80s. Yeah. So I'd, uh, I'd gone through IT uh, back in those days, it was called DP, data processing. Okay. Okay. And uh, in, in, uh, in the mid to late 80s, I, I just burned out. And, uh, and I, I 
changed careers, changed industries completely. I lived out in Pennsylvania at the time, so I took some classes of chartered financial consultant. I don't, I'm sure things have changed over the years, but financial planners is what we were called back then. And while we got into investments and all, everything else, what paid the light bill was life insurance. I mean, health, disability insurance helped. Uh, PNC, uh, property and casualty, there were all the different insurances, and, and together they helped pay it. But once you made a life insurance sales, you were usually good for a long time on renewals or commissions, whatever you would call it. Right. Life insurance salesmen had the art of the deal, if you will. Uh, I'll use that, uh, that phrase. They knew how to ask for, for referrals. That was, uh, that was the first time I'd ever learned about asking for referrals. And depending on which company you were getting trained by, it was 10 referrals or five referrals. Nobody ever got down to two. The right. numbers were big for referrals. And I can, I can remember the deer in the headlight look that people would give me. Who are 10 people that, you, you know, if you feel that you've benefited from my call today, who are 10 people that you feel would also benefit? 10? They couldn't think of one, you know, right. because of that very thing. Now, it could be that, that they couldn't think. I think in retrospect, it's more likely, gee, I just met this guy. I, I gave him money for a, a life insurance policy, but that's 30 bucks or whatever it is for the, for the month. How do I know this guy isn't a flake? Or nowadays, some sort of, yeah. uh, uh, of, I don't know. You know, I live in the cybersecurity world, so everybody's a hacker behind every right. bush, so to speak. But, you know, how, how do I know I can trust this guy? They, they don't know me. Uh, yes, they've agreed to a, a, a contract with me in a life insurance or some other type of insurance. They don't know me and yeah. they want me to introduce for, they want me, the, the, uh, the, the person that just bought the contract, just bought the, the life insurance. They want me to introduce him to my, my relatives, my friends, my business associates. Why would I do that? Yeah. So the way you approach it, once again, what a difference. Now, now we're not, uh, we're not asking somebody to, uh, to automatically trust us out of the blue. Uh, we've earned their respect. We've, we've earned, earned yeah. what, what a difference between trust me on blind faith and, uh, and, and trust me after I've proven myself. Yeah. It's, no, it's that's absolutely right. And, and, uh, and just to tie into that. So a lot of times I get asked, well, how, you know, how do I build that credibility, you know, and, I think one of the things, Ron, to your example, like in the life insurance world, same as the uh, stockbroker world that I was in, that was, was once you sign the documents, now you ask for the 10. Mm -hmm. And now there's going to be a lot of people out there that disagree with this, but I don't think you ask that soon anymore. I think you have to earn that credibility. And so a lot of times you think about it from the moment you're a prospect for me and you've signed something, now you're clearly a customer. There's a quick transition. But I haven't really packed up any of the claims that I'm going to make. The only thing I've done is convinced you to sign the documents, if you will, in that case. And so we have to really strive on a process to make sure that the customer is moving forward. And most of all, Ron, we protect their reputation. We protect their name when they're ready to refer us. So about 2005, I'll give you a really good story uh, for, for your listeners. And this is a powerful tool for any salesperson out there. So if you want to build credibility with, your, with your, the people that you're working with, the easiest way is to simply just ask, which seems like a no duh, right? But I came up with this, I came up with this process again in 2005, and I called it the scale of one to 10. And I wrote about this in the book. And this is a powerful tip for, it's an easy tip for all of your people. So I would go out and I would ask my customers, I'd pick the ones out there that I'd start with. And I'd, I'd go out and I'd say, look, John, on a scale, if I was calling on John, I'd say, John, on a scale of one to 10, one being you want to fire me as a banker and 10, but 10 is that you're willing to give me a referral, a written testimony, or maybe field a call from a potential prospect. Where do I rank? And when I first started doing this, it was choppy and it was weird, right? As most people would kind of think. But you think about what the power and what I created then was the fact that if you told me, like if John in this example told me it was a 10, then he already knew what I was expecting. He had already agreed to it because I said, if it was a 10, I would like a referral, written testimony, or you'd feel the call. So he's already, he already knows what I've set up. 
And when those tens happen, there's kind of a process, which I'll come to in a second. But the key in this is anything that is nine or less, all you do is clarify, never defend. Mm-hmm. You know, so if they say, Larry, your, your customer, sir, I gave you a, a lower number because your customer service is poor. Never sit and try to justify why those problems never happen. Your goal in that is, is to basically look at it. In this case, Ron, Ron, what would it take then if you ranked me this, what would it take to get to a 10? And you just clarify and write it down, mm-hmm. right? So I did this, right? The first time I said, again, as I mentioned, 2005. So I go out, I'm going to try this. And so I go out to this guy named John and I said, John, now keep in mind, I'm out at John's business every month for probably about four hours. So it's a, it's a more of an intensive customer than most. And I go out and say, John scale one to 10, one being you want to fire me and 10 being you, you'll give me a referral, a written testimony, or you'll feel the call. Where would you rank me? Now I'm feeling good, right? I'm a young banker at this time. I'm feeling pretty good about this is the good one to try it on. He sits back <laughs> and he says, he goes, an eight, I'll give you an eight. And so I did what I just told you. I said, okay, uh, John, I said, and I got my pen out and I said, tell me what it would take to be a 10. Now keep in mind, again, everybody, he understands what a 10 is. So he's going to tell me exactly what it takes to get to the ending objective that I want. And um, so I'm writing it down, but I've also told him and the power in this is I've told him that I care about your, you know, having credibility. I care about what you say and I'm willing to work for it. So go back to the life you can save kind of example. So I'm telling him, so there's power in this. And so he tells me, he he sits back and he says, you know, Larry, he goes, I'd like you to come out more. I'd like to see you more. And so now in the back of my mind, Ron, I'm thinking, okay, I'm already out here four hours a month. You know, I mean, how much do you want to see me? And, I, and so, so I said, uh, John, I said, so clarifying, I said, uh, John, are you talking like every two weeks or every week? What do you, what do you want? And he goes, no, once, once a month is, is enough. Now I'm confused, right? And, and he sits back, he goes, you know, maybe, maybe when you come out, maybe you don't just talk all about business. Maybe you just talk about something personal. And I thought, I looked at him, I said, John, I can do that. I didn't realize I was a young banker. So I was going out to these businesses, you know, and I'm trying to be all business and I forgot the personal piece. And that was the difference for him between the eight or the 10. So fast forward now I'm coming out, you know, once a month and the next, and it's choppy, right? He knows what I'm doing, right? Because I'm trying to talk personal and he knows that I know that what he knows (laughs) that I'm doing, you know, that type Uh of thing. And so anyways, about three months later, he's kind of busy and he, he comes out of the office and I, I, I head that way and he walks up to me and says, Larry, here's, here's two names of uh, friends of mine that run businesses here in town. I told him what a great bank you are. Give them a call. And I closed both those deals, Ron. Oh my because, goodness. That's yeah, the way you do it. It does because he realized that I was willing to work for it and that I was going to prove their credibility. If I'd worked that hard for him, mm-hmm. I'd work hard to make his name worth it. Now, there's a, there is a key, though. When they do give you a 10, one of the powerful things that you can do is getting, the, getting those written testimonies. There's a bit of a science behind it, but getting those written testimonies that you use and, and build a portfolio of those so you can go out and prove to prospects how great you are. You've got customers that will give you written, right, mm-hmm. or they'll give you a referral like John did, or even field a call, which is even more powerful. But that, Ron, is how it's a simple tip that your your listeners can use right away. You can implement it right away. It doesn't. I never once in 15 years almost ever had anybody say, I'm not, I'm not going to answer that. Or that's a dumb question. Right. Everybody answered it. I got all sorts of ranges of them. Some of them you realize you may never get to attend. Some of them you do. So, yeah. yeah. Uh, the thing there's a, several things that strike me about that example, and again, that's in your book. I love your book. All these the, you've got great examples, great metaphors, great uh, uh, great advice. Uh, there's some great lines, some one-liners that I've uh, I've again I've highlighted. Mm-hmm. Um, but but one you put in the work before. Back to my my example. I mean, it was at the end of the sale, completion of the sale, and they encouraged you to make it a one-visit sale. Yeah. So. Uh, entirely, entirely different. So you've put in the work, you've developed the relationship. You were seeing this guy four hours a week or four hours a month. I forget which. Four hours a month. Yeah. Four hours a month. So he already knew you'd put in the time. Either he really wanted to have a personal relationship with you other than business, or he felt that you were only there for the business, 
or he really just wanted to test you. You know, will this guy do what I say? So when you did, you've, you've nailed it when you said, what will it take to get to a 10? And he says, well, you got to do this. And you do that. Well, there's no place to go except, you know That's what? Right. This guy really does what he says he's going to do. Times haven't changed any. Regardless of industry, the majority of, of businesses that I encounter, and I have other people tell me the same thing, most people will promise you the moon, but they don't do what they tell you you're going to do. That's right. They, if they do, they don't do it when they, they tell you they're going to do it. That's right. People just don't, don't follow through or follow up. Uh, this guy knew you would. You had, yeah. you had proven that beyond a shadow of a doubt. So now what happens? He, uh, he, he says, I trust this guy now with, with other business associates. I don't know if he played golf with him because, you know, nowadays golf isn't so, so big, but it was back right. then. Right. Don't know if he played golf with them. Don't know if they were personal friends who also ran businesses. Don't know how close they were. But it meant something to him. It took all of this to get him to do it. And he did it on his own. I love right. that. Yeah. I love that yeah. story. So we're getting down to the, to the, to the wire here. We've got okay. a, a roughly 10 minutes. What, uh, what's some things I haven't asked you that I should have? What are some, uh, some last minute thoughts? Yeah, absolutely. I'll tell you, um, uh, you can combine the, the, in the book, there's, there's three sections. So the sales industry expertise is what we spoke about. That's, that's digging the information, doing the work up front. connections. We just spoke about that. And then the business acumen piece, Ron, that's in the, in the third section is really about a sales professional developing and knowing who they're speaking to so that they can speak in a manner that's more effective. So that's, and I pulled those three together, but I'll tell you a really cool story about combining sales industry expertise and the authentic connections and, and how this kind of, it'll sum up where, where, how this ends up working. But uh, years ago, uh, I had a, a, a business banking manager and a, a banker were out doing some work and they ran across a hospital deal. And, and uh, they had, they had mentioned the hospital uh, chief finance officer said, yeah, we're going to, we're going to build a building. We maybe only need about three, $4 million this fall you know, we'll give you a shot, right? So we talked about that, you know, just we'll give you a shot. Uh -huh. So they come back and they're all excited. They got it in their pipeline. Now I'm covering it with them. And I said, okay, well, this is March and that's not until this fall. I mean, what are you going to do to create more value? I mean, I'm not looking for just a shot. I'm looking to get the deal. Mm -hmm. And of course, now this is a new market I took over. So I'm getting the blank stares like, well, what do you mean? <laughs> you know? And I said, well, you, you need to go out there and find out what, call them back and see what kind of value we can create. And so, of course, they called and to get, you know, get this meeting and I knew what was going to happen. Uh -huh. The CFO, the chief financial officer said, no, thanks. I said, I'll give you a shot this fall. And uh -huh. that's when you'll get a shot. And so they come back with their heads down. And I said, look, what we need to do is we need to find out what's going on in the industry. And I talked about this a lot in my book is the cross industry learnings, which is kind of the combination of these two, which is really the idea of going to industries outside of yours as a sales professional but sell to the same customer mm -hmm. because then you can gain insights which is part of the industry expertise and you can build connections so i said look a hospital buys a lot of equipment let's go find out who who sells all the equipment to the hospital so we do we cold called the 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 equipment dealer the guy that supplied the the stuff to the hospital I said, look, I'm going to make a trade for you here. I said, what I want to know is how does this particular hospital, this prospect, make their decisions? What's important to them? What trends are happening in their industry? What's I want to know what's going on. I mean, anything he could, you know, confidential or share with in confidence. And uh, I said, in return, I'll introduce you. This is the connection piece. I'll introduce you to three other hospitals that I finance. Maybe you can do their equipment. So it was a win-win back to the soldier piece, right? Where, right. where we're both trying to help each other just be better. He comes out and gives my team a good couple hours worth of information on this particular prospect. So now it's time to bid for this particular deal. I think it was $3 million is what it was. Now, of course, you know, I won the deal, right? Deal, mm -hmm. right, Ron? Because otherwise it wouldn't be a cool story. <laughs> the team did. But here's what's interesting. Not only did we win the $3 million deal, we won a, not another $17, $18 million in loan exposure, treasury management. We won the entire banking relationship. Wow. Which is fascinating. Now, here's why. And this goes to the heart of it, the heart of both, well, really all three of these and the fact that 
that when the chief financial officer got the proposals, every other bank in town gave a one page proposal on the $3 million loan. Ours was almost 30 pages long. And what we had done is we detailed trends in their industry, how we thought it would affect their operation and how we had solutions that could overcome that 30 pages. And so all of the book really comes down to this idea. It really comes down to what the CFO told us, the chief financial. He said, we gave you all the business because your sales professionals knew our business as well as we did. Wow. You were able not only to address issues and trends that we knew about in our industry, but you gave us some insights on ones we hadn't even thought about. And that's why we won that deal. And that just cemented years ago what this book is about, what my people, my teams were about. And that's how we started to win deals at the prices. In fact, I'll even add on, we were not even the lowest cost for, on that deal. We were the second highest out of all of them. They didn't care, Ron, because we knew them better than others. And that's what sales professionals have to take back. Gosh, what a great story. I don't want to uh, let slide um, the tools that you provide. I printed them off. The book uh, says to go to your website, which um, I want you to give out your website, how people can contact you before we, before we end this. But some great tools. Um, I'm looking at them here. Story template, pre-call yeah. plan summary, uh, find your level of value add in sales meetings and business drivers and trend worksheets. You want to uh, just kind of note just a moment how that's helpful, how people can use yeah. it. The book goes into it, but, uh, but just so the, the person that's listening, maybe this will be the, the uh, deciding factor for them. It isn't just the book. It's also downloadable materials. Yeah. So the, so the tools, we'll use those in conjunction with the book. I also use those in depth with the kind of the sales training process, teaching sales professionals how to really get down and, and use those. If you want to succeed in sales and if you want to grow market share like the teams that I had were able to do, you need three things, Ron. You have to be able to create intense value for your customers. And that can come in the form of the conversation like we talked with the industry expertise. You have to be able to prove that value, which is one of the most overlooked things in sales. A lot of times people just throw out superfluous claims like we got great customer service, we got great this, and they can't prove it. And then the last piece is really designed, what you have to have is the ability to turn that into a story to steal your competitor's dream clients. What the tools do is help you to pull that information all into one spot so you can start to put that together so you strategically can win those deals. That's what yeah. they're for. That is great. And, and uh, again, I, I've got to encourage people to check out the book, Walls, Walk the Sales Plank by Larry Young. Uh, Larry Young, uh, you know, my, my mouth works great except when I try to talk. I'm, uh, so um, how do people get a hold of you? How can they find you? Yeah, so there's a couple of different ways. Uh, the, the website is boilingfrogdevelopment.com and you can, there, you can have all the resources there. There's a contact form as well on there. There's also boilingfrogdevelopment at gmail.com is my direct email. I use that. They can get a hold of me there. Or, uh, or the direct line 480-734-8323 is another way to get a hold of them. And I can more than welcome to have conversations and that type of thing. But really, the book gives a good basis for those sales, sales professionals to succeed. So, Well, it's, uh, it's a great book. Um, I thoroughly enjoyed our time together. And, and I hope you'll come back. You're doing, uh, you do a lot of keynotes on uh, keynote speaking on leadership. I'd love to have right. you back to talk about that. And, uh, and indeed, uh, I think we've talked about that in the past. I'm looking forward to that happening. Um, thank you. Thank you for all you do. I wish I'd had your information back when I was uh, in, in that sales position we talked about. Uh, didn't have you back then. And I, I think life would have been a lot easier, and maybe a little more profitable if I had. Yeah. Um, we've got two minutes, and then I've got to, uh, I've got to end this. L last words, last thoughts? Yeah, I think... Um... What, what, what the focus of the book and the focus of what I do is to really put the value back in sales professionals to really, uh, and it's not that we lost that. I think we lost it maybe in terms of stereotypes and things of that nature, but to really bring the sales professional back first and foremost, rather than focusing on social selling 2.0 and those types of things, really having the human aspect of the sales and the relationship piece, building credibility. And most of all, 
always having the customer at the center of it and really focusing uh, so much on, on the value that you can provide. I always tell something, and maybe if we talk about leadership some other time, but I used to have a model with my sales professionals that if you always talk about a number, your people will feel like a number. If you talk to them about how they create value for their customers, they'll feel valued. And if your people feel valued, the sales professionals do, they'll provide more value for your customers. And that's how you win long-term, deep relationships with those individuals. Excellent. What a great note to finish on. Larry, thank you for being a guest today on Chatting with Ron. It's been a pleasure. Thank Folks, you. thank you. Uh, thank you for listening to Chatting with Ron. Uh, as I've uh, mentioned before, we come to you on Mondays, Monday mornings at, from 8 to 9 a.m., from Friday afternoons from 1 to 2 p.m. on WVLP. Best way to listen to that, unless you're local in Valparaiso, Indiana, is uh, WVLP.org. Uh, if you are local, it's 103.1 on your FM dial. Uh, as far as finding us on demand, you can find us on a whole bunch of podcast stations, uh, Apple Podcast, uh, Spotify. Uh, there's, there's a host of them. Check us out on those. The name of the program is Chatting with Ron. If you're interested in underwriting either on the, uh, on the radio program or on the, the uh, podcast, please check that out too. Thank you for being with us. I hope you have a great week.